most accounts, you know, if you're any sort of a producer at all in any sort of an agency, 90, 95% of your customers renew just by giving them some reactive service. But the real litmus test is what percent give you a referral? What percent turn into raving fans? It's time! Work! Play! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. I want to start this intro out with two amazing testimonials from sales folks in the insurance industry. The first is from a producer from Hub International. Roger has been a coach and confidant of mine for over 20 years and has helped me grow as an insurance and risk management professional. My multi-million dollar commission book of business has quintupled because of the strategies and behaviors learned from Sitkins. The second is from a producer from EHD Insurance. Hiring Sitkins is potentially the best decision we've ever made to improve the performance of our sales force and our sales management group after many years of trying to improve our sales velocity results on our own. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with two of the most renowned sales trainers in the United States. Roger Sickens is the CEO of Sickens Group and developer of the Sickens Network and the Better Way Agency Program. Roger is recognized as the nation's top insurance agency results coach. Brent Kelly is the president of Sickens Group and was named one of the top 12 young agents in the country in 2012. He is also the host of the popular Agent Leader Podcast. Together, Roger and Brent have trained and mentored thousands of insurance professionals. In our discussion, we talked about Roger's background, Brent's background, and how each of them got into sales consulting and agency optimization, major success stories with agencies they've worked with, specific sales tactics and strategies, and finally, how your agency can get access to the experts at Sitkins. Today's podcast is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you are tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose First as your primary financing source and experience the first difference today. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Roger and Brent. Roger and Brent, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to a conversation. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. <laughs> it's great to have you guys. So how did each of you guys get into sales training and insurance agency optimization? Well, as the older guy, I guess I'll go first. Um, I made an early career decision. I chose parents that owned an insurance agency. Pat, that might sound a little familiar to you. <laughs> Very okay. familiar with your dad mm -hmm. and um, got involved in the agency, spent time there uh, through a chain of events, met somebody by the name of Gary Holgate, who was the first ever independent insurance agency consultant. And I hired him to come in and work with my agency. I figured I didn't know what I didn't know. And I really wanted to take the agency to the next level. And over time, I just realized that um, the stuff he was talking about worked. Our agency was doing great. And one day he said, hey, how would you like to go out and consult with some other agencies? And I thought, um, okay. And he said, it'd be a great opportunity to travel, but more importantly, you'd learn more by consulting. So that really started it all. And I just found that I had an absolute passion for that. We had our family agency in Michigan, just south of Detroit in Wyandotte, Michigan, but I had a passion for that. And it also gave me an opportunity to um, live where I wanted to live. And I wanted to live in Southwest Florida. So that's how it all started. And here we are 42 years later with um, a heck of a lot of experiences and hopefully can share some great ideas today with your listeners. Brent, how did you get into the insurance agency consulting world? Gosh, Roger just condensed 42 years very briefly there. So now <laughs> I got my work cut out for me. Um, you know, like, like all, uh, all insurance professionals, I dreamed as a small child of, of being in the insurance agency world, right? Isn't that what they all say? I'm uh, being ha ha funny. Mm -hmm. um, no, I actually, I started in the insurance industry world in the year 2000, graduated college and uh, found my way into uh, a nice size regional agency in Wisconsin and uh, worked for there about five years in production and then moved on to another agency in Illinois, which is my home state. Uh, worked there for about 10 years 
And, uh, you know, kind of what Roger said, I had a passion uh, for leadership and coaching and development. I just didn't know what that meant. Um, and took a, a pretty big leap of faith at the end of 2015 and started my own consulting company. And I uh, was speaking and training. And uh, I had a few hits, but I had a lot of misses. Uh, I realized the insurance industry world's pretty good. Those things called renewals. Uh, I missed some of those things, uh, mm -hmm. but was out there, you know, doing some different stuff and happened to, I must have done something okay because I uh, happened to catch the attention of a guy by the name of Roger Sitkins in uh, early 2017. And uh, we connected, had some great conversation, started with the Sitkins Group in uh, 2017, and uh, here today, still uh, loving what I do, which is providing coaching and, and just helping the agency become the best version. So it's, it's been a blast. You guys have been highly recommended by lots of agencies that we work with at Evolve. And I know that you guys have an incredible track record of success. Can you talk about, for our audience out there that is, isn't familiar with Sitkins, some of the major success stories that you've had with producers and agencies across the country? Brent, I'm gonna let you lead that one off. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, Roger's probably got, you know, he'll share some great examples. You know, for me, um, it, you know, in fact, I was just sharing with my, my team this morning, Pat, that, um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, I knew of the reputation of Sitkins before I joined, right? They were established brand and, uh, and hearing stories like you have of agencies. So I knew from the outside uh, what they did and, and actually being part of the inside now and coaching agencies, I've been able to take that from a, a head answer of, hey, I know that works to wow, like we are transforming lives. And so, you know, a couple of the agencies that, that jump out, an agency I had the pleasure of working with uh, in South Carolina and an agency who, you know, like a lot of, I, I think, you know, what I, I resonate really well with would be agencies who may be several years in, maybe my age demographic that are, are working their tails off, but maybe needs some direction, um, a little bit of refinement in different areas, whether it's in leadership or a process. And this was an agency that, that joined uh, our network a few years ago. And um, two things that jump out with this agency, Pat, number one is they began to have a, a plan of action that didn't drive themselves nuts. You know, one of the things that I think agency leaders forget sometimes is yes, money's pretty good, but freedom is even better. And so I think the success story with this agency was the fact they realized that you can make more money and still be trapped. And so, you know, part of the, the, the process is how can we help you get really focused on the right stuff? And so they, they've tripled their organic growth rate uh, over those couple of years and continue uh, to build their team. So that was a great success. And one, one more success that, that's recent, and, and maybe we'll talk more about it, was just an agency that lost focus in pipeline. And just to get, you know, a, a visible uh, pipeline um, you know, something that's visible in their pipeline and then a process around it to watch an agency write 750,000, actually 751,000 new business revenue uh, in one year, which is, was pretty awesome just by getting focused and helping them uh, to stay committed to it. So there, there's many more. I know Roger will probably dive into a few, but it's just the, the biggest thing that I would say, as I said just a minute ago, it's just watching agency leaders who have so much, and we don't like the word, but it's potential. And to watch them actually go, you know what? I've been holding myself back and my team back. Let's go. That's fun. Yeah, so, so much of it is when they, they realize that there really is a best version possible of them sitting out there. And it's when you can just literally see a click. Uh, several years ago, and this is a story we tell at our producer program all the time because it's true and it's really impactful. But we had a producer that came down for the camp and it, it was his second or third visit. And he and I became very close friends. In fact, he wound up going with me on about four or five uh, mission trips to Nicaragua. We went there to build homes in this unbelievable poverty stricken cool. areas. But we, he came in, or he was coming back for the session. He said, hey, let's, can we go fishing together? And he was from the West Coast of, you know, in California, coming to the West Coast of Florida. He said, I'd like to do some fishing. I said, sure. So he came in a day early. We're out there fishing. We'd really become good friends. And, and then all of a sudden, the weather came in and just slammed us. So we got off the water, and we went to a waterfront restaurant on Fort Myers Beach. And I looked at him, and I said, how big do you think your book of business can get to? And he said, well, I'm at about 650000 now, and I, I don't really see it getting much bigger. And I looked at him, and I said, are you kidding me? I said, I see a million dollar plus producer. And it was one of the coolest things. I'm sure Pat and some of the brokers you work with you, you almost hear a click in their brain where it goes click. Wow. And mm -hmm. a new file opened in their brain and they saw 
that better version of themselves, best version possible. So I challenged him. I said, what would it take for you to get to a million dollars? And we talked through it. And guess what? He hit it pretty quickly. Well, that was about 12 years ago. So it's certainly been a while, but he's just bumping up against 6 million of commission income now, one producer. And it's just, wow. it's fun. It's when you see the people that say, okay, we know your stuff is basic, but more importantly, we know that when you do the basics better than anybody else, you get the best results. So we see that all the time when the people just get literally laser focused saying, what are the things I've got to do? And, and we see this all the time, just so much fun. So we always talk about it in the camp saying, hey, do you hear a click yet? Do you hear a click? And they start talking about their clicks. And what they're really doing is they're getting rid of these self-limiting beliefs and they're believing in themselves at a deeper level and they realize they're worth the investment. So just tr things like that happen all the time. Brent, you mentioned renewals and I see renewals as a really double-edged sword in the insurance industry because they're great, right? They're that uh, recurring revenue, but I think they also breed an attitude of complacency. Is there any areas where you see um, like a lot of common mistakes that producers will make or are there ways that producers can um, avoid that attitude of complacency that renewals bring to the table? Yeah, the, the word complacency. In fact, uh, as you said that, Pat, we had about a year or so ago, our uh, chief operating officer, Janie Cahill, does such a great job with us, um, you know, challenged us as a team as we challenge producers and agencies and this idea that complacency doesn't live here. And I think, you know, as you said, you're right, that renewals are an incredible thing in the industry. What a powerful thing. In fact, you don't have to do a whole lot. And about 90% of your clients stay with you. It's a pretty good business model, right? But you're right. What it does is it does breed a, a, a false sense of security, so to speak, that people get complacent. Obviously, it leads to, you know, well, good is good enough. Well, you know, we believe that, you know, good is the enemy of your best version possible. And so I think, you know, a big part of that out there is that if you would compare, and this is certainly true with producers, if you would compare yourself maybe to some different industries, even in sales, I'm doing pretty well. But when you look deep within yourself and going, am I really truly doing all the things that I could and should do? And not just what that would mean, certainly to me in my life financially, but the clients that I serve, right? And the community and the ways that I can give back. When you begin to think bigger, even going back to Roger said with the clicks, it changes the game. Um, as far as some of the mistakes, I guess, that you make, I, I will just start, you, you mentioned renewals. Um, it's one of the biggest things that we teach and preach at Sitkins. In fact, we have this uh, kind of crazy concept that, in fact, we want to make, we, we want to stop renewing accounts. Hey, stop renewing accounts. People say, well, what do you mean stop renewing accounts? Well, most producers, most sales teams, along with their service team, we consider the renewal a 30 or 60, maybe a 90 day process. And it's just a few things that we're, we're checking off the box. But a mindset of that, the continuation process, and that's how we look at it. Are we renewing accounts? Or are we continuing relationships? There's a difference, both philosophically and then strategically as you walk people through. So a lot of the mistakes that we see is the fact of, hey, I wrote a new account. I'll talk to you nine months later, maybe when the renewal comes up or we'll, we'll do some reactive service in the meantime, which is probably pretty good. And quite honestly, that doesn't cut it. And, and so this mistake that we make is we just take many times, take our relationships for granted. And we truly believe that this is a relationship and a risk advice business. And both of those need to be proactive, not just reactive. Roger, is there anything you would add to any common mistakes yeah. that you see producers make? Well, with, with the renewal, just to tie it down even more, the reality is that you can become semi-successful in this business pretty easily, saying it a little bit differently. And you can make pretty good money, in fact, real good money. More, we always kid around and say, you're making more money than your, than your siblings, than your parents, than your friends, more money than you'd make if you had a real job. Most of us would be fired if we had real jobs, okay? And just, I, I really say, get on your knees every morning and say, thank you, big guy, for this career. Now, let me maximize it. So the semi-successful trap they fall in is they're doing pretty good and not doing all the stuff they know they should do. And, and they just they just kind of are just showing up and doing things rather than saying, wait a minute, I've really got to change the game. And Brent mentioned 90 percent. Most accounts, you know, if you're any sort of a producer at all in any sort of an agency, 90, 95 percent of your customers renew just by giving them some reactive service. But the real litmus test is what percent 
give you a referral. What percent turn into raving fans? And when we start our programs and are teaching this, the answer we normally receive, maybe 5%, maybe five. So what does that tell you? You're vulnerable. If, if they're not a raving fan willing to say, you know, you need to go deal with this guy, this gal, then you're vulnerable. So we think there's a, a real problem for most agencies out there, but they just haven't realized it yet because they can do okay. There's no doubt. I've said on this podcast many, many times that we are in the relationship business. So I'm really glad that you reiterated that there. You guys talk about the MBA of sales, but it's not the MBA that most people would think about uh, when they talk about going back to school. The MBA of sales sounds like it's mastering basic activities. Can you guys speak to how a salesperson can master the basic activities for sales? Well, yeah. number one, they've got to make a commitment to mastery. And mastery, as we define it, is that you know something so well that you can do it. You're just in the zone. You know, if you played sports at any level, you were in the zone. If you were in theater, if you were in music, you could just play without looking at the music, okay? Because you know it so well. So when you've mastered something, you know it so well, you can do it. And it's, it's a conversation from your heart. It's not a scripted event. OK, and then secondly, you know it so well that you can teach others. And we say from a pure leadership perspective, you could survive an ambush. So if the if your leader came up and said, hey, um, how do you ask people the continuation question? How do you get a referral? How do you how do you get to know their other trusted advisors? How do you handle these objections? What do you say on the phone? Just all of these things. And if you can't handle an ambush, you haven't mastered it. So mastering the basic activities are things as, as deep, and we love acronyms, as you probably already know, Pat, to, to a degree. I was kidding, I'll say I'm a member of AA Acronyms Anonymous, only I got kicked out because I failed. <laughs> but one, one of the many ones we use is deep. It's delivering excellence in every process. Most people get some great ideas, the trivial many versus the vital few, and they chase a bunch. And us quick start mentalities, uh, you know, the A personalities, we love great ideas. And so here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. And rather than going shallow and chasing a bunch of things, we say, what are the vital few things we've got to go deep on? And so it's delivering excellence in every process. So one of the key things is, do you have a high performance or a high maintenance team? So most agencies have high maintenance teams. They have sales and service that fight each other versus working together. And one of the things of the many, many things that Brent has developed with, the, with our programs, he says it very clearly. He said, look, we have the same goal, but different roles. The goal of the high performance team is retaining and obtaining ideal clients. Pretty simple. Retain and obtain, obtain ideal clients. What's the avatar you're going after? Let's go get them and let's keep them. Same goal, different roles. And what we see, in fact, a, a litmus test for us is what percent of the time are the salespeople, and this is mastering the basics, what percent of the time as a salesperson are you actually selling? <laughs> okay. And we've actually coined it now red zone and green zone. And the green zone is when you're doing four basic activities every producer should do. They should make sales. They should manage relationships. They should have a continuation process and they should fill up their pipelines. And so if you're spending 80% of your time in those four activities, that's 80% green zone. What we see with most producers and most teams is the actual opposite. They're spending 80% of their time, maybe 90% of the time in the red zone. And the red zone is all the hysterical activity that happens out there. It's getting caught in the service trap. It's being too busy to get better. I know I should practice. I know I should rehearse, but I don't. Uh, another, another basic activity, are you, are you rehearsing your presentations? I, one of the things, this happened early when Brent had first joined us. One of the young producers in the program, we go around at the end, what did you really get out of today? And this one young guy said, well, coach, I'll tell you what, biggest thing I got out of today is I'm no longer going to practice my presentations during the actual presentation. Like, <laughs> Duh, what a blinding flash of the obvious, you know? Uh -huh. And so those are some of the basics. I'll let Brett build on some more. Yeah, I mean, those are all foundational things. I, I think, you know, overall, it's it's funny um, as you see things, because a lot of the things that we talk about, and, and Pat, you know this, I mean, they're not like, oh, in a million years, I never could have come up with that concept. But here's just one example. In fact, in our, in our producer training camp, uh, we do, and Roger talked about preparation and practice and some of those things, um, that we just take it for granted. 
And so a question that, that I ask producers, I would ask this audience for, for any agency leaders and producers listening is on a scale from one to 10, how important is communication to your success? And you know, every time, right? The answer is 10, 10, 10, 10 usually 10. It's 12, yeah. 15, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Followed up by the question, how, on a scale from one to 10, how proactively and deliberately do you practice that vital skill every week? And mm. then the answer usually drops in half four, mm-hmm. five, six. And so people go, well, I already know how to talk. Well, I know you do, but just like in a sport, if, if dribbling a basketball and basketball is a vital skill, you consistently practice that. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes in the insurance world, we see producers and other professionals that get away from some of the basics that have made them successful or never address them at all because they can wing it and do okay. And so part of that is, are you prepared before every appointment? Mm -hmm. Are you asking engaging questions where people say, you know, Brent, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before, Mm -hmm. right? And able to deliver and ask and earn referrals and these things, because it's funny, people know it, but when you say, well, fine, let's just practice it right now. Let's do an ambush. And they all go, because they're not ready. (laughs) And I had a mentor years ago say to me, Patty said, if you're not ready when the opportunity presents itself, guess what? It's too late. Every single time I've practiced a presentation, it's always been better. There's literally no harm in rehearsing and practicing, and I'm always thankful that I did. And I always tend to come up with a new idea on you know how I should get creative around a certain point or how I can deliver a certain part of my talk in a more effective way. So I'm, I'm with you guys all the way on that. If I'm a producer and I'm kind of like a blank slate, brand new producer, Are there any daily habits that I I should look to instill along with um, rehearsing and practicing for presentations and meetings? Any daily habits that you guys would recommend? Well, it starts with the morning routine, which is the habit, obviously, but it's even more than that. It's a Sunday review because we we really believe that most producers start Monday going, well, I've got a few appointments. I wonder what else I'm going to do this week. And they literally, we call it, they just react to the inbound arrows. They go to work and they have good intentions. Today's the day I'm going to hit the long ball. Today's the day I'm focused. And then all this crap sticks to them. They become Mm -hmm. crap magnets, you know, rather than saying, wait a minute, I've got to be very purposeful in what I want to do this week. And it starts with, we always call it Sunday evening review. We don't care when you do it, as long as it's done before Monday. A Sunday evening review, totally debriefing last week. What did I do? What appointments did I have? What things did I do? What percent of the time was I in the green zone versus the red zone? You know, where's my pipeline? All the things that are important. Debrief it and then pre-brief this week. What are the things that I have to do? And a big part of it is just how many appointments are you going to have? And and we, we have the producer's perfect schedule that calls for 10 appointments a week. Three on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's a morning, noon, and afternoon, plus a floater where you can, some people call golf, okay, but a, uh-huh. a floater where you go out and do something with a major relationship. Yeah. So there's 10. And the daily habits of number one, are you filling up those appointments blocks with clients, future ideal clients that avatar and centers of influence? And if you don't have that, you're not ready. Another huge one, and this this was, it's it's always interesting. Even in the mastery level programs, we have our elite 50 producers. It's amazing the breakthroughs that happen. And we started talking about the fact that so many producers in today's world are aggressively waiting for the clicks, pings, rings, and dings to happen. So they have an opportunity to do some practice quoting and unpaid consulting. Rather than saying, who am I purposefully going to go after? And so we challenged the producers during the COVID time when, when people just totally disconnected and the world obviously suddenly changed for everyone. And we said, you know, there's something, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. You know, I've got this magical tool right here. If you can see, I guess you can see it now there. Okay. It's called the cell phone. The second word there's phone. You know, you can actually make phone calls on it. And what drives <laughs> me crazy is when producers say, well, I sent an email. What'd you do then? I sent another email. What did you do then? And so we said, you know what? Here's another acronym, Pat, Palmer. Uh-huh. Pick up my phone. Just pick up my phone and talk to people. And during the COVID, the reaction they were getting was amazing. And so what we said, you know what, why don't we make it a part of our producer's perfect schedule that on Tuesday and Thursday morning, I'm going to block out 30 minutes. And rather than just showing up and waiting for the inbound arrows to drive me crazy, hysterical activity on the way to the grave, as we say, 
let's just take Tuesday and Thursday and do some reach out. So on the weekend, I'm going to think of three names on Tuesday and three names on Thursday. I'm going to call. And we say it's pretty simple. Find a client, a future ideal client, and a center of influence that you could call. And it's always amazing. In fact, one of the first times we did this, and this was still in the live event, by the way, it really became even more during COVID times. We had a producer out of the Tampa Bay area, 1.7 million of commission income, very, very successful. And that's what we find is that, you know, and he'd been through my program 20 some years ago. He said, I want to, I want to refresh on the basics again. I want to really fine tune. So we said, okay, at the break, go call somebody. And he came back with the biggest smile on his face. So what happened? He said, I called my best center of influence. No technology here other than a phone. I called my best center of influence and I called and just said, you know, I was thinking about you. I want to thank you for all you've done. How are things going? And the guy said, wow, thank you for calling me. By the way, I'm glad you called. I was saying, I got two guys you need to talk to. So part of the routine is just saying, knowing the habits and behaviors that create results, something that Brent and I preach all the time, the numbers that you have, your sales numbers, your closing ratio, whatever it may be, the size of your agency, the numbers are the end result of behaviors and strategies, which is what you asked about, behaviors, routines, et cetera. So just identifying what are the things you do that are coming back to the four money-making things, and have you purposefully scheduled on your calendar to do them? I'm not as great on calendar blocking. Brent's pretty darn good at it, okay? But to me, if you take calendar blocking and you say the things I have to do, I need to make an appointment with myself to do it because most of us will keep appointments. All right. Mm -hmm. By the way, no fake appointments. They're real appointments that should actually go on. So that that's my take. Brent, I know you want to add to that. Well, everything you said, ditto. Um, I mean, I think, you know, like it goes back to some of the basic things there. What hit me, though, I, you know, Pat, one of the first things that we talk about, certainly with producers, is you got to plan your life. You got to plan your model or someone else will. And this goes back to a great Jim Rohn quote I love. And he said, you know, if you don't design your life, there's a good chance someone else will. Guess what they have planned for you? Not much. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's such truth to that. And certainly we see that with producers in particular is that, gosh, I hope this week, this week brings me good fortune. I, I hope that my calendar suddenly fills up. You know, I hope that this person calls me back. And there's a, there's a drug out there, Pat, I don't know if you're aware of this. It's, 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 it's prevalent. It's taking over certainly the insurance industry where, do you know what it is? What is it's it? It's hopium, hopium. <laughs> it's out there. And, and, you know, it's just one of those things that we see out there. So I think the first thing is just, what's your model? I'd ask, what, what's, what's the business model you want to create? What's the future? Now, young producers, they're going to take a while to figure that out, but have some plan of what you want. The second thing goes right into what Roger said with the calendar. I mean, every hole in your calendar is a lost opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the hard thing is if you go in and go, well, from, you know, Tuesday morning, I'm going to do some prospecting. No, you won't. No, mm -hmm. you won't. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got it intentionally planned and you commit to it, right? And that's where young producers, well, it's kind of inconvenient. I kind of don't want to do it. So I might do some checks and emails, uh -huh. right? And that, and that goes back to what Roger was talking about. And then I would say the last thing is this, and, and this is one of the things that does take development but prioritize what clients you actually want to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we believe not every client's a great client. And certainly, as you True. know, Pat, what your world, there's some power in owning a market segment or a niche or a niche, however you want to say it, right? Mm -hmm. But try to figure out as a producer, what can I own? Because it's a noisy world out there. Mm -hmm. You got to say something that matters. And if you don't, you're lost in the shuffle. I have a young producer that always, he always says the quote, and I love it. It, uh, the quote he says is a goal without a plan is just a wish. Mm -hmm. So I think that falls right in line with what you're saying. I also, I've, I've personally been doing like a Sunday morning review and planning session for myself uh, after I read a book called the 5am club. And oh. I got to say, I like, if it's written down, it's in my schedule from everything from my appointments, my meetings, um, to my workouts and my meals, for example, if I'm trying to eat healthier on a given week, I am like 99% more likely to do it if it's written down, it's in my schedule and I'm just relying on my calendar. So I, I'm a personal verification of the planning. And honestly, I think I just, I feel calmer and more at ease because it, my schedule is more predictable. Um, so I'm, I'm with you guys on all those points. 
Is there um, one, one big area I see producers struggle in the beginning is when they are faced with an objection, specifically over the phone. I think it's most, um, it, it seems to have a bigger impact when it's over the phone because people need to react right away, but also via email. So for example, if I say, hey, you know, I think that, um, you know, we should meet based around this or that. And, um, you know, the, someone's like, you know what? Sorry, I'm actually dealing with this broker X, Y, X, Y, Z. Is there any advice you have for producers that are looking to overcome objections in a uh, positive way? Well, it's a great example of not being prepared because mm -hmm. there are no sales without objections. There's order taking, but there's no sales. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so just to be able to say, all right, what are the standard objections that we have? And having all the producers within an agency and have the service team in there too saying, what are the, what are the most common objections we have and how can we handle these? And just getting the team members together to say, here's the objection. How have you handled it? How have you handled it? What would you say? And then getting people to practice it because reacting to objections, especially with the younger producers, they take it personally. They don't even know you. They can't dislike you yet. They don't know you. Mm -hmm. all right? Maybe they'll dislike you later. Okay. But they don't know you yet. And what they're, what they're objecting to is insurance. And because most producers lead with, hi, you know, we've, um, you know, we represent a lot of carriers. We'd like to give you a quote. We can probably save you money. Gosh, they haven't heard that 97,000 times a week. And so, first of all, what is the compelling message? How do you get their attention? What is it you do that differentiates you? OK, how are you different? What's your 30 second commercial, your elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it? And being able to practice the responses. If they say this, what are you probably going to say? And it's amazing to me that that most most of the people we've run into, I'm sure, Pat, with you, I'm guessing most of the listeners have never had a list of here's what it is. And so it, it's, it's the whole concept of best practices. What's the best way to handle that? And so if it's the first time they hear it, they're going to, they're going to fold. If they say to mm -hmm. themselves, you know what? We practiced that one two weeks ago. I got it. And now they're in the zone. They can answer it. That would be my response. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, go, just real quick, add on that, Pat is in Roger alluded to it in a different way, but to me, it's most producers and this is all producers, but certainly young producers aren't very good at asking questions. I mean, you know, I came back to my communication thing. Well, the best part of communication, the most effective part of communication isn't telling people what they want to hear or you think they should hear. It's clarifying and asking and having an authentic conversation so that you have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Is there really a fit here? Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we get objections. There's a defense mechanism of, whoa, 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 you know, whatever, or they recoil or they hang up the phone, yeah. right? Versus, you know, could you explain more what you mean by that? Or could Another, you clarify? Right. Yeah. Another big issue that a lot of producers face is being able to fill the sales pipeline. And Brent, I know you have a great video on the Sitkins website that talks about the $750,000 cork board. Can you tell the story of the cork board? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, but yeah, one of our, our partner agencies, like any agency, you know, we asked, you know, would it be beneficial if you had a fuller pipeline? Yes, uh, of course so. And so, you know, we look at Sitkins is that the definition of a great pipeline is one that's overflowing with more opportunities than time, right? So we've got more, that's a pretty good place to be in. And so um, this goes back to the visual uh, and the idea of just simplifying some things that oftentimes agencies make complex and getting laser focused in one area. And so the story was basically this, let, let's as a producer team define what a future ideal client looks like Let's let the producers begin to put together their list. And then as an agency, let's make a visual representation of our top 100 future ideal clients and what that looks like. And, you know, and again, we've had agencies and Roger, you can attest to this that have done it electronically on a big TV screen. They've had some pretty cool stuff. This agency is like, listen, we just want to execute. And they created a very large cork board where they put three by five index cards of their top 100 future ideal clients with their name. Now, a couple of things on this. One is it makes it real, right? Number two, we find out what's really interesting. And again, maybe not so much with COVID, but it's getting back to this is that you'd be amazed that when you put a future ideal client, there might be someone else on your team, like a service manager or uh, someone in admin, it goes, I know that person, or I know that client, 
right? So it becomes a team approach and there's accountability behind it. So we actually, you know, I don't know, Pat, about you if back in kindergarten or whenever it was, if you ever had a, a star chart where like, if you attended or did something, you got a little star. Oh yeah. If- my, my mom even brought that home. And when we did chores uh, correctly or, you know, at the right rate, then we loaded up the stars and, you know, maybe got to get like a beanie baby or something. Yeah. <laughs> and- Hey, listen, we, we all grow up, but there's still part of that. We go, Oh, you know, I'm making progress. So we actually had four stars that they would put on the board in initial conversation. And you, you know, you kind of going down the list all the way to close. And so there was this, this visual thing here. And of course, over a period of time, it's like, Hey, Pat, it's been six months. Are we making any progress with this client? Well, you know, whatever. And so there becomes a lot more accountability to it. And bottom line is just making it real, making it tangible, making it visible, putting accountability mm-hmm. behind it. Something as simple as a, you know, as a cork board with index cards, 751K in revenue in a year. And that was just the cork mm-hmm. board. They did other mm-hmm. stuff beyond that. So it was a really cool success story. Mm-hmm. A lot of brokers have trouble differentiating themselves in the marketplace. A lot of times they'll go to access to markets, to being a, a expert in a specific field or a specific industry to, you know, oh, our agency has great service. The, a lot of times these are common differentiators that I hear. Do you have any advice for an agency that's looking to differentiate themselves when they're going after new clients? Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. Not surprisingly. Um, like you said, they, the, most of them are just going to say, we give great service. We represent all the companies. We're local. We've been in business a hundred years. And then my least favorite one of all of them is when they say, and by the way, we've got the best people. It's like a <laughs> vortex opened up in the universe and sucked them all into your office. Look, I know you've got great people or they wouldn't be on your team, but I don't really think that if we did the whole universe, you've got the best people. Okay. And plus what you're saying is what they've heard a hundred other times. So the key is to be able to identify your specific points of differentiation, pods, another acronym. And Brent, Brent has a great saying on this is that you, you can't, have a differentiated selling system or approach if you don't know how you're different. So getting agencies and producers to say, all right, what are the things we do that are different? Well, you get a list of them. And our goal is that every producer, every agency has at least five. So you'd be able to list those, but then that doesn't really matter unless it matters to the prospect, the future ideal client. So the second thing is, all right, let's answer that WIIFM, that radio station, what's in it for me? So if I'm a a potential client of yours, why should I care that you have that? What's in it for me? And then thirdly, what's your piece of evidence? Because if you're just yapping as a salesperson and you don't have a piece of evidence that says, this is exactly what it is. And that could be a specific brochure. The best one is when it's a testimonial from a current client saying how that impacted them. It could be things as basic as a business interruption worksheet, but something you really do and be able to prove it. And then finally, and by the way, overall, Pat, this is one of the toughest things to get producers to do. Even in our mastery program, it's tough, okay? But it's a big differentiator. So it's the point of differentiation, what's in it for me? It's the piece of evidence, but then the all important skill Brent mentioned, asking questions. What are the two or three questions you will ask that will create a pain issue in the prospect? Where they're gonna say, no one's ever asked me that before. No one ever brought that up. I don't even know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. when we can get to that. And then we even kid around and say, you've got it so well documented that you've got it laminated because if it's laminated, it must be good. right? It (laughs) must last forever. And it's a big joke and people laugh about the laminating, but get to the point where you've got it. And here's another example. Could you withstand an an ambush? So if I'm your, if I'm the chief revenue officer, CRO, also known as chief reminding officer, but if I'm the CRO and I come up to you and say, what are, what are the five points of differentiation? Why should I do business with you? If the producer can't do it there in an ambush, which we refer to as low risk practice, because high risk is out in front of the prospect where you show up, throw up and blow up. Okay. But mm-hmm. low risk is when you've practiced and you've been prepared. So if you can handle it there, you can handle it out, outside. Brent, I know you want to add on that one. Well, I just, as Roger was saying that, uh, it takes me back and something that, you know, we've developed and refined, but I can remember years ago, um, and I was going to a sales training. In fact, Roger, it might've been one that you would help create, uh, by the way. Um, but within some of the training, you know, you'd, you'd say something and we, we call, and Roger mentioned, it's the generic five, right? These generic things that people say. 
And you would say, well, we've got really good service. And the challenge is, so what? So what? Mm -hmm. what? What does that mean? And so I think we would ask any producer is go a level or two deeper, at least, because what you're saying really isn't impacting anything. And once you go that level deep, as Roger said, then you can figure out what are those questions that we can begin to ask that really change that conversation. Right. And, um, and, and part of this, too, we challenge producers to have five. Um, one of our recent attendees at a producer fit, it was actually kind of funny on, on a podcast that I do. And I was uh, questioning her, or getting her, telling her story, um, young producer in Kentucky. And it was funny. She had actually hit her annual goal in the first quarter of this year, which is a pretty good place to be. And now she's like, now what? But we were having a conversation. And I said, what's been one of your keys? And she was, I really hone into those points of differentiation. And then more importantly, the impact and the questions I need to ask. But she said, I got to tell you, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't even admit this. I only have two that I use really well right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a pretty good start. Because as Roger mentioned, most producers really don't have any. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just, what is that going to be that level deeper? Hey, Brent, on the topic of the podcast, plug it really quick. What's it called? And where can people find it? Yeah, the title is the Agent Leader Podcast. So the Agent Leader Podcast. And my background and passion is leadership. Um, you know, I want people, we talk about becoming a better version of yourself, but it comes down to where do we need to be clear? Where do we need to be consistent? And what are we going to commit to? So I have Roger on, I have guest, other guests on. Sometimes I have something on my mind after an event that I share, but just to help agency leaders really transform and take the next step in their, in their business. Mm -hmm. On the topic of agency optimization, for all the agency owners out there listening to this, Roger, is it possible for you to summarize the agency scorecard that you guys came up with? Um, summarize it would be a little tough, but I can certainly give you an overview. <laughs> the, the scorecard talks about transformation. And transformation is, I think, become a cliche. Oh, we're going to transform. First of all, what does transformation mean? It means going from where you are today to where you want to go. So the agency transformation scorecard is an opportunity for someone to go through and look at 15, 16 different areas of their agency and rate themselves. As an example, Brett mentioned pipelines. So where are we today on a scale of one to 10, where one is an empty pipeline and it's hopium, okay, versus the overflowing pipeline with more opportunities than time. And now I've got a great closing ratio because I only work on the ones I want to. So what it does, it allows the agency to go through and rate themselves in each area. And I think the biggest part of it overall is if you don't lie to yourself, if you really tell yourself the truth of where you are, what it identifies is the agency's current business model, even though they've probably not called it that. Because one of the things that, that hit me about six or eight months ago is that your current business model, in other words, the way you do business, whether it's purposeful or not, but that's your business model. Your current business model is perfectly designed for you to achieve the results you're currently achieving. So you do the transformation scorecard and you say, oh, that's our business model. That's what we're doing. So we have empty pipelines. Um, every account's a great account. We've ignored the 80-20 versus embracing it. So that's our business model. And that's why we're getting the results we want. And so when you get into trend, when you look at this, then the cool thing about it is that you can literally say, OK, of all these things, because we don't want you chasing them all, what are the vital few strategies you need to go deep on? So it's a great tool people can use. I really believe that what what gets measured will improve. And I don't want to take credit for that quote. I, I heard it in the book that I referenced, The 5 a.m. Club by Robin Sharma. Um, but I truly believe that if you are looking at something very closely, tracking it, measuring it, it will improve. The other question I have in regards to agency owners, you guys have a phrase, you say producer recruitment starts at home. Um, can you guys explain that for agency owners? Yeah, well, if you get back to how much one of our, another acronym, not an acronym, but a measurement we have, TSS, time spent selling. And so when we get a, an agency to really look at the amount of time their producers spend producing, because we say somewhat tongue in cheek, what's the definition of a producer? Someone who actually produces. And when you look at the, the percent of producers that actually hit their goals, about three years ago, I did a study for a group of agents that were working together and there were 19 agencies. The average agency had 21 million of commission income. So these were some big dogs. 
And I just, I did a series of questions with them, did interviews. But one of the things I wanted to look at is what percent of the producers hit their goals? 43%. Now, that means either the goals were too high, they were crappy, they were whatever, there certainly maybe was a lack of accountability. But when we get back and say, what percent of the time are the producers spending in those four key areas, the green zone again? And it's pretty low. We, one of the things we talk about that ties to the producer's perfect schedule is the 12% factor. If you take 168 hours, which is the number of hours in every week, it's not an average week, it's every week. And you say, okay, what percent of the time are you at work? Well, 40 hours is 24% of the time. Oh, you mean I can have an evening and a weekend? Yeah. So you've only got 24% of the time to really improve as a producer. What percent of that 40 hours, the 24% are you spending producing? And if we can get a producer face-to-face, and that includes, of course, virtual, but if we can get them face-to-face 20 hours a week with clients, future ideal clients, and centers of influence, that's only 12% of the whole week. And yet when producers start like the first day of our program, it will say, how many hours a week are you honestly doing sales-related activities? We're lucky if we hear 6% of the time. Wow. So, so producer recruitment starts by getting your current producers to produce, getting your producers to do like the young lady that Brett mentioned. She's a superstar, by the way, mm-hmm. but all of them can be if they're in the right job and if they have the passion for it. But getting the producers to actually say, OK, the number one thing I've got to do is produce. And that means I've got to retain and obtain my avatars, my ideal clients. And that starts with, I better have a great high performance team that's going to support me and not allow me to get caught in the service trap because average producers get caught in the service trap because they aren't being held accountable to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's my reaction, Brent, fill in the gap. Well, I, I think the you know, the obvious part is the fact that, you know, the, the idea of producer recruitment starts at home is the fact that if you plug a, a, even a decent producer, you know, well, we got to go find someone externally. We got to go find someone. And by the way, there's times you need to do that. We're not against going out and finding great producers, of course, right? You need to do that. But it's let's put someone in our agency when we still haven't defined our process. We still don't have a different, you know, we don't understand our differentiation. And, and a superstar is going to figure it out. We get that we don't really have a high performance team. So they're going to struggle with communication with their team as well and get trapped in the office. So we're not fixing the actual, you know, the actual problem, right? In many cases, we're not addressing the true thing that's going on. And, you know, bottom line of this, and this is something that we do our sales leadership program. And I think sometimes it's missed as you say, you know, what is the number one job of a sales leader? Now, in some cases it could be the agency leader as well. Right. But what's the number one job of a sales leader? Well, well, gosh, Brent, is to get sales, right? Well, that's the outcome. The number one job of a sales leader is to help grow and develop your sales people. And so if we're not developing internally and maximizing what we have there, why in the world do we think bringing someone else in that's suddenly going to fix the problem? And again, I think part of that is there's a little more work and there's a little more challenge to that. But I see agencies just go through this you know, rotational thing. Well, people in, people out, people in, people out. And they don't really ever address the the real issue. Brent, we were talking last week. It sounds like the easiest way for brokers to get access to you is through the all-inclusive model. Can you speak to the all-inclusive model and how, if I'm listening to this, if I'm a broker and uh, I want to work with you guys, how I could do that? Yeah, the the all inclusive model. It was a little bit of what was the outcome of of COVID, you know, and that whole idea. Quite honestly, I mean, it was one of those where, you know, we run a lot of producer camps. We have our private client group with agencies, and you know, there's different aspects of that. But you know, 2020, we repositioned ourselves, right? We had to pivot in different ways, and we were running all these virtual programs, which you know we didn't expect to be doing. And what happened is, is people would say, you know what? this is pretty darn good. In fact, this is really good. In fact, I don't have to go somewhere. And in fact, I don't have to pay for travel, all those things that we know. And so we were running all these different camps and we're sitting here as a team and go, you know, why don't in some of these camps, producers produce as much as they could. And some do a great job, whatever, you know, why do some sales leaders struggle to talk with their production team and all these different ways that we look at it? Well, it's because there's not a common language. And, and so what would happen is, and for example, we'd have a producer who would attend our camp and go, gosh, this is, this is good stuff. I, I want to be able to do some of this. And they would get back to their office and they'd go, why doesn't my service team get it? 
Why isn't my leader on board? Why aren't they holding me accountable for stuff that I want to do? Well, because there isn't a common language. The all-inclusive model is designed to say, hey, here's a holistic approach to agency development. We got to have service and sales on the same page. We got to have sales and leadership on the same page, right? We got to have everyone. It doesn't mean they're going to all speak the identical language, but the results have been incredible. But you know what? Now they understand where I'm coming from, and I can better communicate internally, so that I can better communicate externally. Externally, so holistic approach, a consistent process, mm-hmm. where all of our agencies, Pat have an idea to say, this is the cool, this, this is clarity of back to the transformational scorecard. Let's see where we're at and let's identify where we want to go. And let's let everyone have access to this core training. So they all can hear this message. And then from there, let's take the next step and go deep in a specific area. So the all-inclusive model is set up to walk agencies through a process that's holistic, it's consistent. And the last part is we have community support, which is great. I mean, Raj and I love to talk, as you can probably tell, and share ideas. But I'm sure you've been there, uh, Pat, where you've gone to a program or event and all of a sudden someone says, hey, you know what? And you go, oh, I never thought about that before. So we want to really emphasize the collective genius of the group and the core and the agencies and the attendees. So yeah, the all-inclusive model is giving agency access to everything at just one monthly price. So it's easy for them to implement. So if I wanted to access that, should I just go to your guys' website? Yeah, the best place is sitkins.com is our Sitkins. website. Uh-huh. But sitkins.com slash AIM. Okay. Model, AIM. And that's S-I-T-K-I-N-S dot com, correct? Correct. Slash AIM. Yep. Slash AIM. Got it. Cool. Well, to wrap up the conversation, guys, I have five rapid fire questions for you. And when we go through these questions, I will have... Roger respond first and then Brent respond second. The first question I have for you guys is what do you think is the best sales movie of all time? <laughs> what are Brent and Kelly's videos? <laughs> <laughs> is that your answer, Roger? My answer. Yeah. I don't, you know, part of it is I don't, I don't want to, that's a great, that is such a great question, Pat. I'm frustrated because I want to give you like the generic answer of all, what everyone yeah. says, but that's not what I'm thinking. Uh-huh. Um, you know, you know, okay, this one hits me and this is probably, I, I may come up with something else. The first thing that hit me, I love sports movies because they tell a great story. Uh-huh. I think Rudy is a pretty good sales, sales movie. Can you expand on that at all? Yeah, because there's so many lessons in that movie, as far as someone who doesn't belong somewhere, but because Uh they have the mindset and the passion and the work ethic and the fact that nothing's going to stop me, Uh guess what? It's a pretty cool ending. So I'm going to go with Rudy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Good answer. Good answer. I know. I was thinking about that question and uh, there's so many that come to mind. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, Pursuit of Happiness, Oh, that's you know, a good one. Yeah. The, the list goes on. Pursuit of Happiness hits home for me because it was filmed in San Francisco in okay. the the true story of the guy who's based in San Francisco. And it's one of my favorite Will Smith roles. So if people haven't watched that, I highly recommend uh, it. That's that is a fantastic one. So that's a good mm-hmm. reminder. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have a favorite client that you worked with? You know, I've got a a, a thousand of them, but probably uh, there's two right now. Um, one is probably the one that Brett will say, so I'll, I'll skip that one. But yeah, one of my best clients ever, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago, but it was Chris McVicker, the Flanders Group in New York. And he was the first agency I ever worked with that we, and he was one of my first private clients. In fact, we fired each other several times. Okay. He fired, <laughs> I fired him because I love people that challenge. That makes, I, I always said, you know, you're a real pain in the butt, but you made me a better consultant. Um, he was the first agent I ever worked with that got revenue per employee up to $200,000. And this was back when a hundred was pretty good. Total, total specialization, just a, a great agency, great team. Uh, then he got it to 250 and then we got it to $275,000 of revenue per employee, but he was committed to growth and development better than anybody. And I wasn't the only consultant he worked with. He had some people in other areas. And one day I asked him, I said, Chris, why do you have so many others? You know, you just have me. But he said, well, you don't know HR, you don't know this. And he said, it's real simple, Roger. He said, I don't know what I don't know. And I want to find out before my competition does. 
So he would have to jump in mind. And then the second one, I don't, Brent, I, I'll let you answer yours, see if it's the same one I'm thinking of. Well, I, I always hate, this is a tough question because even I said, I've got so many clients I love to work with and I could tell a number of stories, but I think I know where Roger's going and I can't disagree. Uh, an agency worked with in Pennsylvania. In fact, we're going to go out and see them in a few weeks. Um, and this actually, to what I said earlier, for me personally, uh, and I could tell a whole bunch of things of results they've done, which is pretty incredible. But for me, it's one of the, probably the first one for me as a coach with Sidkin's path that I went from, Hey, this stuff is really good. And I know it should work to there's an emotional connection when people understand some of this that's transformational. And um, and this agency, um, and, and, you know, Roger, you can add on to this, but as, as you said, again, I, I, you know, I went to Roger and I'm like, are all agencies like this? And he's like, probably not. They're one of the best implementers we've ever had. And it starts with leadership. And I think for me, I've learned so much, just like any of our clients. I mean, we, we love to teach and share, but man, the learning that I get in being in rooms with people and having conversations with smart people, um, and and I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due from the top because he's actually retiring here officially. Uh, his outgoing parties in a couple of weeks, but John Miles, uh, one of the one of the best leaders I've ever been around, and learned tons from him. So um, incredible agency, Roger. I knew you were going to mention him, so I don't know if you want to add anything. Well, it, I mean, there's so many that we could mention. Uh, Kevin Elliott and you know Kevin Charleston, on and on. But as far as pure execution and leaders leading. Um, Right now it's EHD and I always kid around and I hope John listens to this. We'll make sure he does as part of his retirement. But I always say, you know, John, you're so close to being the number one agency ever. And that would drive him crazy. And he would do something cool. And I'd say, I'd send him a message going, boy, the number one agency is really shaking in their boots now. And he, he was just the commitment he had to be the best. And it's really cool. And he's a great personal friend. Mm -hmm. The next question came up because you guys are based in Florida Orlando Heat, or excuse me, uh, Orlando Magic or Miami Heat? Well, being a, being a very tall person myself, <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, I'd have to go with Orlando. Well, I don't personally live in Florida, so I'm going to go Chicago Bulls. All right, all right. But, but I will say I would pick the Magic because I remember even with the Shaq and the Penny days, they were fun to watch. Okay. And, they had, and they had an Illini guy by the name of Nick Anderson, uh, who had a story who couldn't make free throws at the end, but I'll go there. Orlando magic. <laughs> All right. All right. Sounds good. Is there a book that you would recommend to insurance brokers? Wow. We get, um, we, we get kidded a lot because we always have a book. Here's another book and here's another book and here's another book. If I had to pick one book, I think I know which one Brent's going to pick. So I'll pick a different one. It's, um, probably the one thing by Gary Keller, Keller Williams, because what that book helped me do is the concept of getting laser focused. And I, I love the overall state. Well, there's a couple statements there that are great. If you chase two rabbits, you're likely to catch neither one of them. Okay. And then second, what is the one thing such by doing it that everything else becomes easy or, or unnecessary? And I, I had been using the concept of the one thing, not even knowing there was a book, for 20 some years, because we, at the end of our coaching calls, we would say, what's the one thing we could do to bring more value? We believe that producers should ask that question of their client during every meeting. What's the one thing we could have done to bring more value? How could we better service your needs? And you don't say, is there anything else we can do? Because the brain goes, no. But if you say, what's the one thing people get focused? So that would probably be mine. And, and by the way, there's probably 35 others. I'm a voracious reader and studier. Mm -hmm. I'll probably forget. There's so many, but I had a little time to think about it. Business book um, that's more recent, uh, it's a couple of years, three years old now, I guess. The Road Less Stupid is absolutely one of my favorite books uh, by Keith Cunningham. And I don't know, Pat, if you've read that book or heard of that book before. Uh, I, I, actually, I haven't read it, but I've seen Keith speak, actually. Okay. And so, and I first listened to the audio book. So it was very, you know, now go think you'll thank me later. He's just got that very, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, His voice is iconic. It, it is. And it's, it tell you what, but it's a book where it, I think it teaches us all that we need to slow down and make sure that we're not running enthusiastically in the wrong direction. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a great reminder for me. And I try to go back and reference it quite a bit. Personal development book. I'm a, Raj, you know, I'm a huge John Maxwell fan for personal development. I love the 15 invaluable laws of growth. Cause it just teaches people to say there's so much more in you. And I love that book. Final question for you guys. 
what are you most excited about this summer? Well, from a, well, the summer overall, just time with the family. I'm at my vacation home now. But from a business perspective, I'm most excited about some of the new things we're doing. And I guess we'll have to let him be the first one to hear this other than our team this morning. But um, our overall theme is we're working with agencies. Um, we're writing a book and we're coming out with it. The working title now, I don't know if it's a final title, but the working title is Ensuring Your Agency's Bigger, Better Future. You're in the insurance business, have you insured your own business? And so I'm very excited about that because of the message and the clarity it's going to bring. So from a work perspective, that, and of course the all-inclusive model. Yeah, I, from a personal perspective, uh, you know, I got I have five kiddos with one amazing wife. And so we're heading on vacation in a few weeks. So looking forward to that time, that'll be um, chaotic, but enjoyable all at the same time. A lot of members being made. And then just from a business thing, I just think, you know, here it is the summer and, you know, I live in the Midwest, uh, things grow. And I feel that's what we're doing as an organization is we're putting things together that are growing. I can't wait to see the harvest of some of the things that we're putting together right now, what's going to happen. And there's just a lot of excitement. So I'm looking forward to it. So if brokers that are listening to this want to get the book when it comes out, is there a timeline you guys have for when you think it'll be released? Brent, what did you say? <laughs> um, it, when we, we've actually just started the process, uh, but it's yeah. supposed to be pretty, pretty quick. Um, the, and again, as far as when it actually gets out, it's a great question. The goal yeah. will probably be uh, sometime mid fall. Okay. It's okay. going to come cool. out this year. Yep. Nice. Nice. More to come there. And Guys, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate the insight. I highly recommend that if someone's interested in anything that's been brought up to contact you guys, because I know you guys have multiple plans and ways that you can consult with individual producers, agency owners, um, everything from sales strategy to full-on agency optimization. So um, look forward to working with you guys in the future. If there's anything you ever need, you'll have to let me know. And uh, I know we also host our Cyber Sales Academy. Maybe there's going to be some crossover there uh, with uh, general tactics and strategies that we can work in from a cyber perspective. But that said, guys, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to speaking with you both soon. Thank you, Pat. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, guys. Today's podcast is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you are tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose First as your primary financing source and experience the First difference today.